Well, hello and welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show with me, Andrew Eborn. And I'm delighted, absolute delighted, that today we're going to go all the way to Philadelphia to see my good chum, Charlie. How are you, Charlie? Hello, Andrew. How are you? Greetings and salutations from Penn's Land, you know, the home of William Penn. We love it. We love Pennsylvania. Absolutely. And, and a, a child of Philly. Um, you've grown up there. How many years now is it, Charlie? Oh, you're, uh, hold on to your shorts, will you? <laughs> I just hit my 85th birthday a few months back. It is incredible. And many, many happy returns to that 85th. Thank you. I know for your 80th that uh, Sir Paul McCartney um, did oh. a little video message for you. What did you do for your 85th? Well, first of all, when Paul wished me happy birthday in song, and sang my, my hit song, Fabulous. I passed out, and then when I woke up, I said to myself, was that a dream or was it true? And I was honored, of course. Now, an absolute delight. And how did you celebrate this year? Well, quietly, you know, I worked. <laughs> to me, that's always a blessing to work. I, I love to work. Now you're an incredibly busy performer, 14th of May. 1936, the world was introduced to the young Charlie, uh, an absolute delight in uh, Philly. Um, your father was particularly encouraging for you to pick up the guitar and things like that, wasn't he? Well, if it was for my father, God knows what I'd have been today. Uh, I was 10 years old. If you got a quick minute, I'll tell you a quick story. We took a walk to a place called South Street, which later became famous and so Where do all the hippies meet? South Street. Well, when I was a kid, it was a mill area. So he had, this is 1946, right after the war, you know, the big war. <laughs> and uh, he saved up $15 and he was going to buy himself a suit. In those days, you got two pair of pants for it in case you got a hole in the pants. So as we were walking down the street, it was a mill area. It had the haberdashers, shoe shops, porn shops, haberdashers. And every time we pass a porn shop, a porn shop, he'd hesitate. Finally, he said, you know what, Charlie? Heck with the suit. He said, pick, pick an instrument out. I want you to make something of yourself. I don't want you to work like a donkey that I have in the factory all my life. I said, okay, Dad. And Harry James was very famous at the time. The big bands were in, you know, married to Betty Grable. So I said, a nice trumpet like Harry James. Nah, I said, you know what, Dad? Get a guitar to be a one-man band. That's I got in show business. <laughs> True story. Uh, glorious. And what sort of music were you listening to when you were growing up? Well, I was listening to basically swing, which was in vogue at the time. The big bands were in. And my mother was a country freak, so I had I listened to a lot of country. And on my own, I would listen to a lot of what they call rhythm and blues or black music. So between the three, you know, my head was so f bursting with all kinds of uh, arrangements and chord structures and whatnot. And I've carried along all these 70 years that I've been in the business. Uh, absolutely incredible. And you had your first TV appearance at the age of, tender age of 16 on the Paul Whiteman TV show. Do you remember those days? Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, Paul Whiteman, of course, was famous orchestra, orchestra leader of the 30s and 40s big rotund man. And when he retired, he settled in Pennsylvania, a place called Doylestown, about maybe 30 miles out of the city. And he had this show for young people to express their talents. So I went on the show and I won the first week. I, I won a hundred dollar bond. I won the second week. I won a 45 record exchanger. You remember those? And each week I'd win a prize. And finally, on the fifth week, I won the family's first refrigerator. We had an ice box before that. <laughs> but I would bring a 10 cent piece of ice and, you know, keep the food cool. Not cold, but cool. And of course, the whole street came out. You might think it was Frank Sinatra that day. Well, wow, refrigerator, holy smokes, you know, a little ice cube tray about that big, you know. And uh, well, whilst on the show, a gentleman from New York was driving in because it was simulcast television and radio. He had a record company right on Broadway called Cadillac Records. And evidently, he thought he heard something unique. And the next day, we didn't have a phone in the house. I got a, a, um, a uh, telegram asking me if I'd like to record for him. Well, I was flabbergasted, my God, you know, when he like 15 years old. So anyway, we went into New York, got my first two or three sides with some great musicians, by the way. I never forget the bass player's name was Bobby Haggard, who had a big hit called Big Noise from Winnetka with the bass. Remember that? Absolutely, I loved it. <laughs> As he played all my recording, I was only a kid. And uh, Luther had this known piano, a black pianist, great jazz man, and a guy named Angelo on, on the soprano saxophone, and myself, no drums. But the first record, no drums. And you know what? That darn record still stands up today. When, when you listen to it, it's amazing. But anyway, he knew how to cut a record. And that was my beginning in, in the recording industry. 
And finally, after a couple of years, I'm up with a local company called 20th Century. No big deal, no hit records. Just I'm a working musician now, performing whatever I can. And then finally, in late 1956, this chap came up to me. He wanted to start a new record company called Cameo Records. He told me he borrowed $2,000 from his brother-in-law and he wanted to start a new record company. I said, well, I'm in. So it was December, it was cold, it was freezing that night. Went into Philadelphia at a place called Record Art Studios. Engineer was Emil Corson, great engineer. And uh, Dave Apple and the Applejacks, who had some of their own heads. Great musicians, great vocalists. And I cut my first two records. This is December. By March of 1957, they only had a hit record, number one hit. My God, I thought I died. My well, I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. My mother was to get up, Charlie, it's time to go to school. You know, and, and, and the rest is history. What can I tell you? No, but absolutely incredible. Those first records, I mean, Butterfly, fantastic, yeah. standing the test of time. It was on a budget, I think, of $600 at the time, wasn't it? I think so. That was a lot of money then. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, $600 to, to do your first record. I mean, how did you feel going up? I mean, for a kid, all of your dreams sort of came together without yeah. any sort of hiccups in those early days, didn't it? Well, uh, it, it, I, I thought it came fairly quickly because I'd already been playing since I'm like, 10 years old, but by the time I was 15, without sounding egotistical, I was a fairly accomplished musician at that time. I could play with anybody. And uh, they even told me that when I understood it, Charlie, you could really play the guitar. I said, well, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> and uh, it carried me through all my career. I was basically a musician before I was a singer. Then my, I was used to play, the, you know, the gazoo, do, 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 do. My father said, put that damn thing down and start singing, Charlie. <laughs> and I became a singer. <laughs> A singer. <laughs> yeah, we love it. And you graduated from the South Philadelphia High yeah. School. Yes, 1954. 1954. And um, I, I thought it was 52. Was it 54? The, the year I graduated was 54. 54, yes, fantastic. So, and, so you went on that sort of basis. What do you remember about your school days? Did you enjoy them? Yes, I was. I, I, let me say, once again, you know, it's hard to just talk about yourself, but I'm only just giving you facts. I was a fairly bright boy. I wasn't a genius. But I would, I'd say a B, B plus student all through the years I performed in high school. And uh, of course, I was to catch me out because every time we'd have a play in school, I'd bring the guitar out. The kids would love it, man, to be dancing in the streets. I thought, oh, don't forget, I had a whole new sound. There was no rock and roll when I began playing and singing. So, and then it came into fruition, of course, it became the biggest thing in the history of music. But uh, it was a great, I had some great years. I played what you guys, you call football. I played soccer in Philadelphia. Right. I was always small, too small for the football team. They wanted to use me as a football. <laughs> <laughs> what position? What position did you play, Charlie? Then a forward. Are you kidding me? I was a great, great scorer in my time. Yeah, <laughs> always like a rabbit. I was fast and small, you know. But I, as a matter of fact, when I first took my first tour in England, I was in Coventry, and they filmed me that night on the BBC, and I, I scrimmaged with the, the Coventry team. Then they threw me in a vat of water and they gave me the, oh, they, what, what, uh, which, uh, listen, I got some great memories, especially of Britain, Matt. Oh, and, and, and we love you over here still, which is absolute delight. Now you also, um, just before you went on to uh, our, our friends at Cameo, Bob Horn's American Bandstand. Tell me about those. Yes, yes. well, I was on the original Bandstand, which was originally a local show, took in the tri-state area, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. That's the tri-state area where we live. And I'd say this about maybe... 20, 25 million people in just those three states. So it was quite an audience. Ooh, ooh. And I, I had done it and I did the boogie woogie blues, the whole thing, you know. And then finally, this fella got in the jackpot and the guy named Dick Clark was sitting in a little studio making $100 a week. And of course, you had the looks, you had that old collegiate look. And he fell right into that spot where they fired this guy. And I was on his show. And then it became coast to coast, my guy. You show you, you hit that show. Huge, huge show. Huge, huge, show. Oh, huge, huge audience. And as a matter of fact, my godfather lived in St. Francisco, Francisco and he said, Charlie, I saw you on TV. <laughs> No, it is a quite incredible and that sort of stuff. And the, the early influences then, I mean, they were the, the, the typical ones that the, uh, uh, the, the big Turner, <laughs> B.B. King, uh, yeah, all yeah. those sort of those wonderful things, Roy, Roy uh, and so on and so forth. Is that right? No Turner, people like that. Oh, uh, absolutely. Hank Williams, I imagine. Oh, uh, my mother was a country freak. Like Hank Williams, Hank Snow, yeah. Ernest Tubb. I mean, I, I, I still do the whole thing if I have to. I do a little country segment, you know, which I love. And that's a good diversion from rock and pop and swing and, you know. 
Oh, it, is, it is amazing. So Cameo Records, I mean, you yeah. basically made Cameo Records, didn't you? Because you had this massive hit, $600 budget, uh, yeah. for Butterfly to start with, followed um, very soon by fabulous, uh, yeah. superb songs, made Cameo Records for them, didn't you? Well, that's what they tell me. And I, I, all I know is I never heard of the company until I recorded with them. And I had, you know, numerous other recordings. Then unfortunately, as business goes, uh, I've got a little problem with the owner getting paid and all that baloney. I, you know, even he talk about it, but it's part of my history. And I said to the guy, if you don't pay me, I'm going to sue you. So the guy said, get in line. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot. So anyway, we settled out of court and I left Cameo Records, right? Unbeknownst to me at the time, Dick Clark, who had the Coast to Coast show, was a partner of Cameo Records. I didn't know that. So when I attempted to sue the guy, I cut my own throat. I never went on bandstand again. And my career like took a zip. I oh, went with yeah. Decca Records, one of the biggest companies in the world. Couldn't get my records played anymore. And, and had, all, all of that sort of stuff was spoken about in Wages of Sin, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. They had a kind listen, let me tell you something. The mafia was not always the Italians, <laughs> which a lot of Americans started their own mob. But that's that's history. I don't even like to talk about it because okay. you know what? They're all dead. Charlie Grace is still here for whatever time I got left. You know, God has a way of evening things out. I mean, it is. I mean, the reason it's important to mention, obviously, it's part of history, the wages of spin. And yeah. many artists that we have on the show talk about those early days where the record company's making lots of money. And it was a bit tough being paid, as you say, wasn't it? Well, even today, a lot of people, listen, uh, I got a book out. I'm still waiting to get paid for that. Yeah. Know? Oh, is that right? Okay, yes. that's, that's an artist who's, uh, uh, who can I tell you, sacrifice. that's part of our sacrifice of being an artist. So you leave a little legacy, hopefully they'll be maybe 50 years from now or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's a, tip, it's a let me tell you something. It's the toughest business in the world, being a performer. When you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, listen, I worked the best of my life. You had Sullivan Show, the Paramount Theater, the London Palladium, right? and then I worked a place called Hoagie Joe's. <laughs> so I, I know what it's, I, I work with places, Andrew. I didn't think I was going to come out alive, to tell you the truth. Yeah. But they were, you know, you win the audience. Big guys, I mean, my God, they would have ate me up alive. They, they, they got to love Charlie Gracie. It must have been my personality. It wasn't my, my looks, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, I mean, on and on and on. And then finally, my biggest break was when I got a chance to perform in Great Britain. My God, I thought, I, I really thought I died and went to heaven because you know, I'm a history nut, and you guys have so much history compared to us. And then when I got booked there, I only followed one other artist, Bill Haley in the Comets, who had their own band. But I went as a solo artist, and I had to perform with what they called the Pit Orchestra and all those Tough way to play rock and roll, pal. Let me tell you. They were great musicians, but the feel wasn't there. You know what I'm saying, Andrew? Yeah. But, but thank God I played the guitar, put it on 10, <laughs> you know? And I sang through the mic that came up through the stage. And you couldn't hear yourself sing. There were no monitor systems in those days. So you sang, your voice came back from the back of the theater, like Sophie Tucker. Right. You know? And many a night I spit blood from screaming. It, was that right? it must yeah. be really tough, but it was. It's some of the iconic places that you played right mm -hmm. here in the heart of London. I'm speaking to you from uh, the heart of London at the moment. You played the Hippodrome, which is just walking distance, and also one, the Palladium, iconic moments. Um, one, talk one, about those one, days. If I live to be a thousand years old, I, I, I'm just so happy they had the opportunity to perform at a historical place like that. You know, some of the greatest artists in the world performed there. And I said to myself, what am I doing here? You know, I, I couldn't believe it. I, listen, I never said to anybody that I was great or even good. I was just happy to be there. My father was a laborer. I, I think he made more than $125 a week in his life, right? And I was getting a thousand dollars a night playing. Of course, I didn't keep it all between your taxes, our taxes, the lawyers, the age. I went up a 10%. <laughs> you know, but I was just tickled. You know, I went by ship on the Mauritania the first time I went. I never was on a boat before. <laughs> Imagine how thrilled. I, I mean, I, I closed my eyes and I could relive my whole life in 10 minutes. It's, it's amazing. 
It, it's and then, incredible, and, but some glorious, glorious moments. So in oh, the audience of yeah. those performances at the Palladium, yeah. the Hippodrome, uh, we had some pretty famous <laughs> people as well, didn't we? We had uh, uh, Mr. Nash and I think a certain, a few Beatles yeah. came along and saw you as well. What a great guy. Well, I didn't I didn't know them. Graham Nash was only a kid at the time when I worked Manchester. He's from Manchester. Then I worked Liverpool where Paul McCartney and the guys came from. I didn't know any of these people. Van Morrison, uh, Joe Carter, on and on, Peter Nuna. And, and I didn't know who these people were. At the time, I was top of the heap, right? And as the years went by, they all became famous in their own way. And when we got to meet, they said, Charlie, if it wasn't the guys like you, guys like us would have never got rich. I said, now you tell me. <laughs> you know, we, we made pittance compared to what they get today. You know, I played the theater twice a day, 3,000 people a day. They play one stadium, they get like 15, 20,000 people at, at 300 bucks a seat. So we didn't make any money compared to that. But you know what? To be a part of the history, and, and my greatest thrill is the British people. I think you guys are the greatest people in the world. I have so many wonderful friends and fans there, even more so than America. And you were my salvation, really. It, it, it is tough, isn't it? I mean, you're right, but the business has changed a lot. I mean, in terms of now artists are being recognised in terms of uh, being properly rewarded, but we still have issues when you get things like new technology and streaming services. We had uh, an artist you may, may or may not know called Gary Newman was saying he had a, a million streams, one million streams, and he wow. ended up with the princely sum of $50. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good God almighty. <laughs> Of course, that much in park your car now. <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing. So the whole business is slightly difficult, but which is why it's important to shine a spotlight on this sort of side, because you as an artist, and you basically forged the way, if you like, for artists that came afterwards, not just in terms of the business side, but also in how you played. I mean, George Harrison said that you were brilliant. I still are brilliant. I never, met, I never met George Harrison, so I really did. Well, he, in, in an interview, that's exactly, that's the phrase that he used. He thought you were brilliant. And obviously your music traveled all, all over the place. Paul McCartney, we, we spoke about earlier, was a big fan. When did you first meet Paul McCartney? Because he oh, says that he saw you performing uh, on stage, uh, I think, at the, the, uh, I mean, the play. He was at the time. That's where he saw me. He said he paid two and six to come and see him. He still had shillings at the time. <laughs> I was just getting rid of, used to the money, and then you change it again. <laughs> so anyway, to cut a long story short, he said, John, I came to see you when you played Liverpool, you know. He said, you inspired us. I said, let me tell you something. I didn't think I inspired anybody. I was just happy to be there getting paid to do what I do. I didn't think it was going to... Listen, Eddie Cochran and I, got rest of the soul, who was my closest buddy, we talked backstage. I think, how long is it going to last? How long I said, listen, if it lasts a year or two, we're happy to even be in this position because we'd be pumping gas if it wasn't for this. So it's it's been a blessing, you know. It's been a blessing. With ups and downs, it's a tough racket, but you know. But no, but, I, but to make a career out of something that you love, they always say, don't they, Charlie, that if you do something you love for a job, you never work a day in your life. Right. Well, you could ask my wife if she was here. She'd tell you, Char Charlie, you're always at your best when you're on stage. When you get off your pain in the neck sometimes. <laughs> but you know what? You see, when you're up there. It's like being a ball player, whether, whether it's football, baseball. You have to concentrate on your vocation. Otherwise, you lose your, you lose your time. And your, it's 100% it's concentration. So you forget your family, you forget your friends, you forget the phone call, you forget the bills. You're there to do that job, and you do it the best you can. And so far, for 70 years, it's worked. <laughs> no, no, fantastic. So Paul saw you in Liverpool that first time. Many other artists saw you as I say, in the Palladium, the Hippodrome and various other things. Tell me how you first met Eddie Cochran, because you went on tour with him, didn't you? Yes. And a well, lifelong friend. We played the Chicago, we played New York and Washington. And I tell you, he was the loveliest kid you ever wanted to meet. And good looking too. I mean, he was a handsome kid. And he was just starting to like get off the ground a little bit. You know, Charlie said, show me. He would tell Charlie, show me a couple of licks on the guitar. I said, Ed, I can't show you anything. You have to, pick, you, your soul picks it up yourself. You can't tell somebody a lick. I can teach you a chord, you know. And as time progressed, he progressed and he got better. And better. It's a shame what happened to that kid in Chippenham, England. And I've done many a show in his honor. As a matter of fact, I recorded a song called I'm All Right and, and his memory. It's, uh, what a wonderful, you'd, if you had a chance to talk to him, you'd have fell in love with the guy. He was just a great person, you know. 
And and the whole of the music industry is populated with uh, wonderful characters. And you've worked with some of the best. I mean, Chuck Chuck Berry. How did you come to work with him? <laughs> what a character he was! Yeah. What, what a great talent! What a great talent! Uh, he was. He was a, I met him when he was a young man. He, I was a kid. And he was still a young man, like in his forties, I think, something like that. Dynamite on stage. Dynamite, you know. And if you went in an encore, Chuck would have his hand out. You want more? Put it over here. <laughs> well, he got cheated out of a lot. He got cheated out of a lot of money. All the songs he wrote, some guys put their names on the records, you know. To, so he got built to let. Listen, he's he's a legend. He'll always be a legend. He was great, great, and, 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 and a nice guy. A nice guy, you know. Yeah, and it, it sounds wonderful. And it's one of those sort of things. I mean, a serious musician as well. But uh, the audience is always used to love my ding a ling. Yes, which I I was not too crazy about. Too. You've had some masterful records, but it's funny how, how it works, isn't it? You never know. But I don't think Chuck was too crazy about it in the end, was he? No, I think he was having fun in the studio one day. And they put it out, and the, just the title of it was, you know, and, you know titillating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. So, so wonderful memories of Chuck. You also worked with the Everly Brothers, didn't you? Well, the Everly Brothers were great. What a great duo. It's a shame they couldn't get along later in life, but. We worked Chicago. Listen to this bill. It was myself, the Everly Brothers, Eddie Cochran, Tommy Sands, Tab Hunter, uh, Al Hurt, the great trumpet player, and the little girl I heard sing. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I, I, I ran to the side of the stage, and it was um, Brenda, Lee. Brenda Lee. She must have been 13, 12, 13. I said, my God, it sounds like a grown woman. And, of course, she became a big star. Too. So just being able to play with these guys and be part of the system, I was just, I mean, what could I say to you, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned about the Everly Brothers not getting on. It's really sad when that happens with the group, but I guess it, it is, it's like a family. I know family is really important to you. You need to have those moments. You're on the road all the time. Yeah, what is yeah. the secret? What is the secret then to getting on? Well, in my case, I come from a, a tight family. My, my grandparents immigrated from Sicily 100 years ago, and I lived with them until I was 10 years old in South Philadelphia. A little row house. You ready for this, Andrew? We had no bathroom, no toilet. We had an outhouse. Thousands of us lived like that during the Depression. So, you know, anything above that was like glory. <laughs> you follow me? The tech, when I was telling me, we moved two doors away, we had a toilet, we had a bathroom. <laughs> My mother thought she died and went to heaven. <laughs> she came from a coal mine town called Scranton, Pennsylvania. Her father was a coal miner. Imagine, you know, you got died of black lung. Of course, you're down in that hole. You know, 10, 12 years, breathing all that. So their life span was short. But I never got to meet him, but I get my other grandfather I got to meet. And I loved him. He was, he was a treasure. He was a, I think of him so fondly. Yeah, I was named after him. And uh, he went to work one day, the poor guy, and he got a heart attack on the trolley car. He was 67, 68 years old at the time. 1946, that was considered up in age. And... Uh, Devastated. We were devastated. My father was devastated. He couldn't go to work for five or six weeks. And he was the only son that had two sisters. And uh, my grandma naturally had to sell the house as she moved in with one of my aunts, one of my father's sisters. And his legacy was $3,000. That's what he got for the house. That same house, two months ago, sold for $300,000. <laughs> <laughs> if you spit at the guy across the street, that's a that's how small they were, but that's what how the world has changed. You know, when I was a kid, you got an ice cream cone for a nickel. Today they're four dollars. Loaf of bread was ten cents. Now that's four dollars. And so forth. So we progressed into bedlam, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I mean, look in England. You got in the car with a couple of shillings. The guy pulls a thing down to seven pounds. You haven't even moved yet. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right, and that's the thing. And do, do you remember what the exchange rate was for? You talk about uh, uh, the two two pound or, or what two, two and six? I think was the the ticket to come and see you in Liverpool. Yeah, uh, who was it? Twenty shillings to the pound? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah twenty fives. That's right. Twenty one shillings to a guinea. <laughs> oh well done the good old guineas and those guinea pigs <laughs> when see? i heard that i thought they were making fun of the italians <laughs> <laughs> so how how much was it what do you remember what the exchange rate was in those days uh I, I, i'm trying to think i you know it's so so long ago i really i really i, I wouldn't make up a story i don't want to do that but i mean now the pound is worth about 
dollar twenty five, something like that. It was, I think, it was worth about eight dollars then. Yeah, no, that, that's what I thought. It was around that sort of money, and yeah, it's crazy because yeah. if you yeah. kept all those dollars, how many yeah. pounds would you have now? You know, six hundred dollars. It's a uh, uh, yeah. well worth it. You got a pocket full of money, you could buy a uh, fish and chips. <laughs> yes. Oh, are you are you a fan <laughs> of fish and chips? Like my, my favorite plate when I go to England. I love fish and chips. We have them in America, but they don't taste the same. Uh, no, well, you're, you're right. It's a fantastic. We, we're very proud of our fish and chips. How do you like your fish and chips? Are you a, are you a cod man or a place man or a bit of? Bit no, of I'm, I'm, I'm a cod man. A cod man. Okay. And Italian, in Italian, that's called bacala. <laughs> <laughs> we ate, we ate that a lot in the house. My grandfather used to love fish, yeah. so we we didn't have fish and chips, but we had bacala. We had codfish. No, oh, fantastic. You also no. worked with um, Bo Diddley. Talk to me about Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley was a character. We worked at Paramount Theater in New York, and he had just bought this big, beautiful green Cadillac. And every time he'd come out on break, him and his guys would be there with the rack polish. <laughs> I said, if I don't know you were in this business, I'd have brought my car. You could have worked on it. <laughs> Funny guy. And, and what a great entertainment. Listen, whether the guy was good or bad, it's immaterial. Once he got on stage, it's like screaming Jay Hawkins. You know what I mean? I mean, you were mesmerized by these people. There's nobody here. This is all fresh stuff now. Don't forget, we, we started a whole new genre in music. And they said it wouldn't last more than a couple of years. That's 70 years ago. Come on, give me a break. Oh. Yeah, it is quite incredible. So after Cameo, and it, there's a, an unfortunate falling out, not the first, nor will it be the last uh, for an artist and a record company. You had a number of other record companies that you went through. Yes. I went with Decca, one of the biggest companies in the world. Couldn't get my records played. I was on the blacklist, you understand? Then I went with uh, two or three other companies, Roulette, Moshe Levy's company. Moshe Levy never paid anybody. <laughs> it, it's Tommy James about it. Yeah, he'll tell you. And, and on and on. And, and people still want to record me. I just cut this new tune called I Can't Stop Block Rocking. And, and a few years ago, I did one called Baby Doll, which hit the charge pretty good. And this one here, everybody's excited about it. So, hey, listen, I'm happy to be breathing at my age. You know what I mean? But this this hope for me because Tony Bennett just turned ninety five yesterday. Oh, absolutely! And we had ninety five yesterday. Many happy returns to Tony, and we had Tommy James on on the show as well, um, very yeah. recently. So he he was great and uh, he's, he's great. Yeah, absolutely. But talking about the mob and so on and so forth. I mean, yeah. and, the, and and people that they they need to know how the business works in those days because. It is. You need to sort of uh, shine a spotlight. They always assume, don't they? They always assume that the guy or gal on stage is raking it in. Oh, Actually, yeah. You're feeding lots of people, aren't you? <laughs> well, you got to remember, we come from working class, let's say poor families. You know, we're poor people. Everybody was poor where I lived in my neighborhood. And uh, to have that opportunity to be in front of thousands of people, it, it, that took the place of the money. You know what I'm trying to say? It wasn't the money then. But then, of course, you wanted to help your family. You got listen. The first money I made, my mother and father, my two younger brothers, I bought a beautiful home for them in the suburbs to repay their kindness to me. You understand? They didn't have to do that. A lot of parents go, "Hey, you know what? You're 18. You're running wrong. Get out." No, no. My mother and father loved me. You know, we had our differences too. But first money I bought. Oh no, I'm lying. The first money I bought, I bought a Cadillac. <laughs> it was my life dream. Five thousand three hundred dollars. White Coupe de Ville. Wow, you know what I mean? The whole, all the guys came up with what for a ride we rode around. Gas was 18 cents a gallon then. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Incredible. What, what do you drive? Do you still drive? What do you drive these days? All right. Well, I, I always drove a Cadillac up until this past year. I, somebody hit me in the back. I couldn't get a bumper anywhere in America to replace it, right? And then a few months later, some woman went for a stop sign hit me in the front. I think God's trying to tell me to make a move. So this poor widow, her husband passed on, had a nice Lincoln, one owner. And I just, I, I bought it from her out, you know. And so I'm driving a Lincoln right now. That's fine. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference, you know. No, no, but, but gas is a bit more expensive now, isn't it? Well, it's, uh, I think I paid $3.20 a, a gallon the other day, which is cheap for you guys, because you're paying a hell of a lot more than that. Oh, crazy, crazy. It's, yeah. it's more, it's more uh, gallons to the mile where we are. I think it's crazy. Yeah. So. The the leader, the right? Now, in, in addition to the musical performances, you were also in a movie, weren't you? Talk, talk to me about Jamboree. How did that well, come about? That was my one claim to the silver screen. <laughs> uh, while I was at my height, of course, they used to come out with these rock and roll films, right? 
So as I, see if I can remember everybody. Count Basie was in one of the yep. great, right? The Four Coins, Jerry Lee Lewis, when he was a young, good-looking kid. I, I met him. We did the movie together. I'm trying to think who else. Buddy Knox, uh, Buddy Knox God rest his soul. Uh, Connie Francis, the voice of Connie Francis was in, and Frankie Avalon was just starting out at the time. Slim Whitman. Uh, Slim Whitman, great artist. I mean, this is all Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins. Oh my God. Blues Racers, the best Blues Racers. I mean, just to be on, just to be on the screen to look up and see yourself. <laughs> you know, I used to pay 10 cents to go to the movies when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but it's a, it's a joy. I mean, being on the screen. I mean, how did you find life on set? Because it it takes a lot longer, doesn't it, to make a movie, obviously, than just a, <laughs> appearing on stage, performing, and off you go again. Well, are yeah, you a patient well, man? Were you patient on set? Well, I'm a funny guy. I take things where it, where it comes. You know what I mean? Of course, there's times when you're blue in life. There's times when you're excited. There's times when it's blah 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 blah. blah. You know what I mean? You just I, I learned to take life a day at a time. And I always had that philosophy, and I still do, even at my age. My wife and I just celebrated our 63rd wedding anniversary. Can you imagine that? I met her when she was 17 years old, for God's sake. And we got married a year later. I had my first child, my son. And then two years later, my daughter. So we had a, we had a great family life. Uh, to me, to, of course, b- music aside, family is everything. Because when you're sick, when you're down, where, where do you go for help? Some guy you don't know. Some woman you go to your family. I mean, I need that's what family's all about. And we were raised that way as kids. And listen, when I used to get done work when I was a young guy, right? I had just married. I had one child at the time. I get done work. I'm packing up. Oh, Charlie, let's go, pal. We're, I said, where are you going? Oh, we're going. I said, listen, where are you going? I said, I'm going home with my wife and kids. And that's why I'm still here. I never was a big drinker. I had like a, a nice lago once in a while, a little glass of wine with dinner. Never too dope. It was out of the question. You know what I mean? And uh, just a number, I'm just a normal person who sings and plays the guitar. That's the what can I tell you? You know, oh, good it's, band, it's, that's it's, it's it's a joy, Charlie, hearing these sort of successes. Uh, and it's Joan, your wife. It's, it's her name, isn't it, Joan? Joan, yes, yes. yes. Joan, how did how did you meet Joan? On the corner drugstore where they had the jukeboxes out. You know what I mean? You, you got to remember, like like movies. They had the jukebox on the pen. We used to go there for a milkshake, right? You know, ice cream soda, and we met. And she kept passing by and passing by. Said, that's a cute little chick, you know. And before you know it, I asked her out. I didn't even have a car at the time. We used to walk. I must have put 40 miles a week in it. Walk here, walk there, walk there. And uh, we fell in love. And then three years later, when I finally got a little success, I figured I got a few bucks now. I asked her to marry me. She said yes. And we've been married ever since. Hey, listen, we're human beings. We don't agree on everything. But when it comes down to brass tax, I still love her and she still loves me. And that's tough eight for 63 years, pal. Oh, six, I mean, it's, it's tremendous, and it's a, an, an industry which is notorious for casualties well, in relationships. What what has been the success, or what's the reason and the, and the secret of your success? Well, as far as the family's concerned, that's the kind of home we came from. Being Italian-American people, that were always tight-knit families. You know what I mean? The father was the head, the mother was the heart, and that's a fact. The mother is the heart of the family, and the father's the head. If he's a responsible person, he takes the responsibility of raising his children and take care of his wife. Now, things have changed since then. Now, women are working. You need more money to live. That's a different ballgame. You know, my father and mother married in 1935. He was making $35 a week. <laughs> and then got married and raised, start raising the family on $35. You go to the store now, you buy milk or loaf of bread, it's 35 bucks. So everything's changed. The world, I, listen, I lived through the Second World War. I was five years old when it started, nine years old when it ended. God bless the British. You know, I, I have all the respect in the world for you people. You're tough. I don't think the Americans could have took that, the bombing and all of you. You're, you're just great people, man. Really great. I, I love you. And Winston Churchill is my idol. They'll always be in England. <laughs> what a very good impression. I thought I was there then. <laughs> I, I idolized that man. He was, what a great guy. You know what I mean? Him, him and Roosevelt, I'd love to hear some of the conversations they had. <laughs> oh, what, did you ever meet many of the politicians over here when you came? Well, over? I met a few governors and mayors and stuff like that, but not no high and mighty kind. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I reckon he would have liked a bit of rock and roll. I, I reckon he was he would have been there, you know. Well, you know what? It's a, everybody has their own. And listen, I still love Montemani. I mean, I love music. I don't care who's playing and what kind of music it is, as long as you're playing in the right tempo and the right key. I love it, you know. But you have to have a 
I, I, I've always prided at myself in being versatile. Right. When you come to, of course, when I when I'm on a tour, like I was with Marty uh, um, Wild. Marty Wild. Marty Wild. We oh, see, I, 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 I know him as well. And you got Charlie, younger Charlie, who I saw earlier, but they haven't seen him on the camera. He should give us a wave or something. Can't you, where's Charlie? Charlie Jr. Come and pop around. Say hello. We did a we, city tour. Him and I. We put a great. Yeah, tour. yeah it was great. Yeah. Great band. And there he is. Hi, Charlie Jr. Because hello, got, Andrew. Like, How are you doing? Isn't he the best dad ever? He is. I'm, I'm his de facto publicist, I think, at this point. I run the social media, he's, he's setting my, up the Zoom. My and... I love it. But, but what I also love about it, because you're the, you're the prompt behind the scenes, you say, because yeah, I, can, right. I can prompt as well. Listen, can I get a shameless plug in? Because my dad is very, very bad. Of course you can. Uh, two years ago, he came out with a book called Rock and Roll's Hidden Giant, his Absolutely. autobiography. And the title was not something that he chose, by the way. A Catholic priest, a good friend of the family, actually chose that title for dad. You know, <laughs> small in stature, big in talent. Yeah. Anyway, it's uh, available at Amazon, uh, Rock and Roll's Hidden Giant, the story of rock pioneer Charlie Gracie. The foreword is partially written by um, uh, Paul <coughs> McCartney and your Sir Cliff Richard. So we thank them profusely for two, their- Two great guys. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Guy. And both of them have covered your songs, haven't they? Yes. yes. Butterfly, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me just say this is about a couple of Graham Nash is a wonderful person. Yes. You know, let me quick story. Could I get a quick minute? Good in man. Of course. I was up at Manchester at the time. I just got done with the theater and I'm on my way to the hotel. And him and his sister are on a step at the entrance to the hotel waiting for me for an autograph. Well, Charlie, yeah, fine. Well, I've always been a smoker, so I was smoking camels at the time. And I flicked the cigarette out and his sister picked it up, kept it as a souvenir. All these years, I didn't know that. So when I finally met Graham and he was on my last two albums with me, gracious man, he said, my sister still has that cigarette as well. Still has it. <laughs> and I met her on one of the tours and box. she looks like him, but with more hair. <laughs> it's amazing. Ah, uh, it's, it's glorious. It's it's the other thing, we talk about these long relationships that you have, and that's been a, a wonderful secret. Family, I know, is really, really important to you. Yes. Um, you also had a really long relationship with your manager, Paul, didn't you? Talk to me about Paul Barrett. Oh, Paul, Paul Barrett, Welshman, Paul Barrett. Great guy. I'll tell you what happened. After after a number of years of performing in England, I didn't go back for 22, 23 years. years. I wanted to stay home, raise my family. I was, I was I really disgusted at this point because I, I, uh, my earning capacity was down. But I always made a living, right? I worked some five sets a night, man, alone on the stage. No band, just me and the guitar, my mouth, my big mouth, right? <laughs> so finally, my agent said, you know what? Oh, no. So, some fellow from Canada. Uh, what was it? Richard Rose. Richard Rose and his wife, Penny. They decided they wanted to put my old music out, the first album I ever cut, like the Boogie Woogie. Pre Butterfly, the early, yeah. the early 50s. And you know what? My popular. I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. Fat Swallow Tune. Great song, right? I love it. I put them out in England, and my base, my fan base was still there and belongs to me. Yeah. So Paul went and Bernie Rothbard, who was my agent at the time, met Paul. He said, I met four or five guys. This guy seems about the most honest one. Let's go with him. And he started the whole thing. And I've been going back ever since. Every year, once, twice, three times, whatever the tour was, England, France, Belgium, Holland. We've Spain, lost track, I think. We've lost track. But you know what? My heart, not, I'm not just saying this to get fans at this point in my life. I'm not trying to make any points. There's something, uh, I play to all audiences, all different nationalities, and they're all great. But there's something about the British people that nobody else has. The tenacity, mm. the faithfulness, uh, and, and, and the, the weird humor. You know, dry humor you guys have. <laughs> you know? It's, and I, love, I just fell in love with you people, and I've been in love with you. Ever since. And, and I, I talk to people from England almost every week. Hey, Charlie, how you doing? Hey, Bob, how you doing? Uh, we have, I built up a friendship where I have thousands of the fans, but friends. That's the beauty of it. That his, yeah. his fans have become friends and they, and they keep in touch. It's like one extended family. Yeah, it's, extended amazing. Family. it's amazing. And that, that's thought, the great yeah. thing about it, isn't it? And there's a real love and a real passion. I mean, Paul himself, he also was the first manager of Shaking Stevens over here. Yeah. Yes, that's yes, right. he was. He had a, quite a bit of success, I understand. I never met the fella and they had a falling out. 
I, well, well uh, you know, it's like a marriage. Some business. people, some laugh, some don't. <laughs> but, but, but you talk about a sense of humor, and, and it's tough. It's tough being on the road. It's yeah. tough with the pressures of bringing up a family when people are not paying you. It's worth going back to beforehand. You need to, just as you with any relationship, work out how you finish. Once you can have an argument, you know you're going to have an argument. How yeah. do you build the bridge after the argument? Well, if somebody's got to concede. You know what I mean? So, but you, you bend. I was always told once, rather than be like a big oak, be more like a, a, a the, the trees on the beach, what do they call it? The palm tree. Oh, palm trees. That could be. It's a hundred mile away that they, they bend. You know what I mean? Flexible. The oak, the oak will fall. <laughs> so I try to be like that. And you try to be forgiving. Sometimes you really hurt. I mean, listen, I put this guy in a map with cameo records and I got, pardon the expression, screwed. Like thousands of us did. You know what I mean? But you know what? He's dead. I don't have any hate towards the man because Without his intervention in my life, I never would have had butterfly and fabulous and whatever his eyes. Yeah. So there's always a good part of something and there's always a bad part of it. So live and let live is my mind. I'm happy for whatever little success I had. I could have been a wealthy man today, but it wasn't meant to be. But you know what? I have wealth in other ways. I have people like you who still want to talk to me after seven years. I have a wonderful son, a wonderful daughter, a wonderful wife, a wonderful daughter. I, do, I mean, you know, uh, and I'm happy. I don't have to have a million dollars. We, we live in a what I consider today a modest home. When I was a kid, this was a mansion, you know. So well, if I had a million bucks, I wouldn't move from where I'm at. I don't need any more room. I'm happy. I don't need, you know. And, that, and that's what they say real wealth is, isn't it? I mean, wealth is not a monetary thing. It's surrounding. Ben Morrison, Morrison, Morrison said something similar to that, right? Yeah, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> similar to what you're just telling me. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. He said yeah, you got more than I got, Charlie. And, yeah, Brian Morris is great. We, I toured with him. I know two thousand. You toured with him. Unbelievable. I met him in Wales, right wow. at the King's Hotel because the owner was a great guy, Mac. Right. So I, this is a funny story. And I, I'm sitting there, I'm having a cup of tea. I mean, always was a tea drinker, by the way. And I see this guy like hiding, looking behind the plants. And I said, hey, "Who was that guy? He had an old lumberjack and all." Well, he says he's a big fan of yours. His name is Van Morrison. I don't know who Van Morrison was at the time. My kids know him because yeah. he's a modern artist. You know? Anyway, I go back to where he says, Charlie, can you come down there? Van wants to talk. And we sat there till four o'clock in the morning, picking my brains about the 50s. He was a fan of the 50s. You know what I mean? So time went by, <clears throat> and uh, I'm ready to work in Wildwood, New Jersey, a resort area here in New Jersey. And the phone rings, and I got lather on my I'm shaving. Joan says, uh, Van wants to talk. He says, Van who? <laughs> Bad I forgot, food. right? He said, uh, okay, wait a second. So I pick up, hello, Charlie, how are you? With the Irish bro, you know. I say, how are you doing, man? What's happening, right? He says, I'm going out to the West Coast in about 10 days. I said, good, I said, break a leg. No, I was just wondering if you'd like to open for me. Holy smokes, me? <laughs> right? So I called the guys in the band. They almost dropped dead the whole fort. <laughs> he paid for everything, tra transportation, hotel, food. And, and what a great, this guy is the Pied Piper. We sold out one day, 2,000 seats, and the manager said to me, Charlie, would you do an extra show? Oh, you, you're kidding, I'm here, I'll do anything you want. I'll pass the leaflets out, whatever you... <laughs> right. Andrew, you're having a good time, ain't you? <laughs> oh, we, we, love, we love it, it's fantastic. But, but Van Morrison, he's a real talent, but he won't suffer fools gladly, will he? Well, he's a funny guy now. So he happened to like me and he took to me. But a lot of people won't like him. Yeah. He blows his cork. Well, of course, he was drinking then. Now I understand he's on the wagon. And what, what a talented guy. I mean, and another thing he doesn't do well, he doesn't face the way he faces the band on the place. He won't just, there's 3,000 people who want to see your face. But that's, that's Van Morrison. Do you like him or you don't? You know what I mean? But what a great talent. And I can give you on and on with different stories and different people. That's, uh, some guys are nuts. Some guys are, you know, what can I tell you? Who, who's the most nuts then? Go on then. Well, Jerry Lee in this time was pretty wild. <laughs> And I understand he's a year older than me, and he's still pretty well. I know we we had Jerry Lee over here, and I also had the joy of interviewing his sister, Linda. Yeah, I worked with her many a time. Yeah, very talented girl. No, she's lovely. I think she's she's been married what about five times as well. Eight, I think it's eight. Eight kids laughing. Yeah, I, I don't, when they tell me that, I just laugh. I don't know. No comment. <laughs> 
Well, it's always good. I, I remember yeah. well, my, my father got married three times. And I, oh, did he? God bless you. I had, a kid, I had a kid brother to get married three times. There you go. I remember when he phoned me up and, uh, and he sort of said, I couldn't make it to the third wedding. And I, and I really felt like telling him, well, I'll come to the next one or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, hey, hey, Andrew, you're right yourself. You know that, don't you? <laughs> you're quite an interviewer, I must say. Uh, well, it's, it's a job, but it's so easy. I tell you what, it's such a delight. Yeah, but you're, nat- you're a natural. You're a natural. You let the people talk. You- Listen, you wanted me to be on your show, and I'm, to- and I'm delighted to. But you give me a chance to express myself. Most guys, you do an interview, and they do all the talk, and you go, yeah, nope. Yeah, like Gary Cooper. You know what I mean? But this- <laughs> it's a pleasure being with I hope I haven't talked too much. Oh, no, you haven't. Not at all. I mean, it's an absolute delight. I was going to talk to you about the accolade, <laughs> how important those were, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and things like that. Tell me yeah. how important those accolades are to you. Well... Listen, I got I got things up the wazoo, all kinds of wars. As a matter of fact, I played last week the mayor to maybe the honorary uh, mayor of the town and all that. Hatboro, oh, Pennsylvania. 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 Well, maybe forty minutes from here. I, I got all these things. I got no place to put them in. The walls are full, you know. And I said, probably when I die, after my kids die, we're going to be trash. We throw it out. Who's going to keep all the stuff, you know? But you know what? It's nice when somebody honors you because you don't. I tell you the truth, I never felt like I deserved any accolades at all. I just sing and I play the guitar, banjo a little bit, bass. I'm, I'm not looking for any pat in the back. I, I made a living. I raised my family, singing and playing the guitar. What's with my father? I don't know where I'd be at today. He probably part of the mob. I don't know. Being a Sicilian, and I speak it fluently, by the way. Oh, do you? Which is like Navajo. <laughs> it's a language in itself. Even the Italians don't like it. <laughs> okay, give us a, give us a little bit. When I bought the chin and a bank, I said, Man Jabba Pane Pum, go lost to Sifuka, and the castle said, Kaka. Zenny said, Sings, and he wanted to get a kick at it. Come here, my grandfather said, Minica, and the Vatsalo Goon, and he just said, The thing, the thing, the thing. And I learned, because they didn't speak English, just about when I went to school as bilingual. Now, everybody conquered Sicily, you know that. It was the Arabs were there, the Greeks were there, the French were there, the Spanish were there. We kicked them all out, and that's how the mafia started. <laughs> and, and we have that the little bit of each language. For instance, I'll give you an example. You know the word guard, like guardian, like the, the Irish use the guardia, guardian, guarda, look, guarda. We don't say guarda system, we say talia. The word tala is in Arabic to see. So we got Arabic, we got Greek, that's bad. They, they call the Italian money, my grandma used to call them dinero. There's no dineros in Italy. <laughs> But the Spanish were there for 200 years. Mm-hmm. So you pick a little bit. We don't know what we are, to tell you the truth. We're mongrels. <laughs> but, but it's a glory. But the, the whole of America is, is a melting pot, isn't it? Well, of course. There are no original. The only original people here are the Indians. And they've shoved them in a hole somewhere in a mountain. I, I always felt sorry for the people, man. Yeah. But you know what? That's what happens when you're a nice guy. <laughs> they should have shot them all at the Brent Landing. And they would get... Who, know, who knows? You know, who knows? Who uh, knows? They say the world's 600 million years old. What are we? Nothing but spit. Yeah. And that's it. You live 100 years, it's still true. Listen, I can't believe I lived this long, Andrew. That's incredible. I can't believe it. And I'm still acting. I can still play. And I can still walk. And I can still run. I don't, well, I mean, having done all these sort of things in the industry for so long, I mean, how do you feel? That, I mean, you did a documentary, didn't you, for PBS, I think, in 2007. And that's yeah. sort of fairly intrusive, looking at your life and so on and so forth. How do you feel dealing with that side, dealing with the media? Well, I never had any trouble. You know what? Because what you see is what you get. I tell it like it is. I don't brag. I don't, I don't undersell myself and I don't oversell myself. What you see is what you get. Like I said, what do you do for a living? I say, I sing that pretty guitar. <laughs> what, what are you going to say? I'm a recording artist. I'm a TV artist. I'm a movie. People don't want to hear that. I know what I've been through. And if you know about it, fine. If you don't know about it, I'm not going to tell you. So, well, well, well what, what I do with all my guests, Charlie, it's a little secret. I, I have to become the world's expert. So I have to work out all the little points of reference. So yeah. I become now a world expert on, on Charlie Gracie. It's got to be good. Oh, you get fed up with him, Mr. <laughs> oh, you see, absolutely. So, so your 75th anniversary, a 75th anniversary on, on this thing, you released a, a single, Baby Doll, which uh, yes. meant that you got played on the BBC again yes. after a yes. long period of time. Well, I understand. That's a good tune, by the way. I like it's a great that. tune. I loved it. All your tunes are great. Yeah. 
And now I got a new one out called I Can't Stop Rocking. I that, love that thing. And what is it about rock and roll? Is there, and their punctuation? Because it's always, you lose an eye or you lose an end or whatever it is. Don't you? It's kind of, that's, that's an inbred thing. It's uh, I, I give a lot of credit to our black brothers and sisters because they, they laid down the blues, man. You know what I mean? And the great country artists like Elvis and those guys, you know, Ernest Tubbo, and then the pop artists. Sinatra. I mean, I could sing night and day, and you wouldn't know the difference if I'm a rock and roller. It's, I always prided myself on being able to play all kinds of music. And when you come to see me, this is a rock concert. I, I'll play a, a, a rumba, play a bossa nova, play a cha cha, do an Italian medley, or do a, 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 a military medley, whatever you want. I mean, that's what I listen, George M. Cohen, you know the name George M. Cohen. I mean, I'm a Yankee doodle dandy. And that whole medley, give my regards to, I could do that whole medley. And, and you know what? To me, it's still fresh because it's great music of its time. But people, every once in a while, you go, gee, I don't know you sang a song from 1920. <laughs> I said, I wasn't alive in 1920, but I remember people like Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor. You know what I mean? There's nobody around like that anymore, really. And, and that is, it is extraordinary, isn't it? Because you talk about longevity in this business. The business has changed so much, hasn't it? Well, yes, it's uh, it's called progress. And listen, I work with Max Bygrace. Who was better than Max Bygrace? Great, wasn't he great? Not only a comedian, a great actor. I saw a couple of his old movies the other night on the uh, old channel. I mean, you know, just to be in the same place with these people, to me, it's still a dream. I still can't believe that I have, I've, I've, lived, I've worked with, Hundreds and hundreds of great artists in my time. And, and, and that's how you, you learn from each one. You pick the best from this one, the best from that, and you conglomerate in your own music. See? So you have not only your talent, but their talent also. But, but it's also, I mean, everybody likes to be recognized or loved. I mean, that's the real secret. So Baby Doll, when you released that 75th yeah. anniversary of your birth, it was the yeah. first time that the BBC played your music for, what, 50 years, wasn't it? We, they thought I was dead. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> but how, yeah. do, how does that feel as an artist? I mean, you, you've been through the tricky stuff as well. I mean, we yeah. talk about it. You've been blacklisted and so on and so forth. <laughs> Music's not played. It must be really tough as an artist because you want to be heard, don't you? Well, you still want to be heard, even at this point in my life. Now, I must say this, that considering my age, if you don't know me and you met me for the first time, you might think I was maybe 65, 67, 68. I don't look my age, whatever God's plan is for me. And my wife don't look her age either. And my kids don't look their age. The Gracies don't show their age. They're poverty only. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, for people to remember, listen, when I first went to England, that's 1957. That's a long time ago, 57, 58, right? And the same people come to see me. I said, aren't you sick of listening to me? We love you, Charlie. <laughs> cool, blimey, governor. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, we, we, mentioned, we mentioned earlier about the wonderful Marty Wilde, and you did a tour with him a couple of years. Great. How did that great. come about? Well, he's a great artist, and he, he works his heart out. He does like an hour and a half on stage. I did 20 minutes. I was like a fill-in. And uh, he was so thrilled to have, he said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of lookalike sound alikes, but tonight we have an original artist from the 50s. He said, and I grew up listening to this guy. He's about four or five years younger than me, you know? Whatever, he works like a dog. And the band he had behind him was great. I enjoyed every minute of it. Every, don't forget, every night we were in a different town. That's tough, you know? Of course, it was a couple of years ago. I was 83 at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spring chicken at the time, absolutely. Yeah, spring chicken. <laughs> and, and it was, and it can be quite punishing being on the road, isn't it? I mean, do you have, have there been massive, I mean, you are you the person that they go to, to sort out the rows on the road? Because it sounds as though you're the guy, you're the glue that every oh, no, tour no. needs. Oh, no, 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 we had, I had my own private driver, I will be honest with you, and this chap has been driving me around for years. Uh, great guy, good driver. He, he drove a comedy team for, called Ball and Chain years ago. I don't know if you remember that. I don't know who they are, but anyway, I think one of them just the last one just passed on. But he he knows a lot about the business. Was it, was it Cannon and Ball? Cannon and Ball. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. There, there, there you go. Ball and Ball and Dave. That's, that, yeah. that's the story of a record contract you yeah. don't want. So Davey's our yeah. driver, and uh, we, we it's like family. You know what? See, when you get to know me and we get to love each other, 
we're not strangers anymore. We're, I consider you part of my family. You know what I mean? Now, from the day on, I don't know how much time I got left, but when I met anybody ever mentioned your name, I say, gee, what a great guy. We had a nice chat. Well, I talked for 45 minutes. He talked for two minutes. But I mean, it was a great interview. <laughs> and he, and, and Yiddish, they called me a Yenta. <laughs> But somebody talked a lot. <laughs> no, but, but we love that. No, you're, you're the perfect guest ever. But I, I love that sort of stuff. So what's the name of your driver? We should give you a shout out to him. Yeah. Uh, 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 Davey. Um, I think it's his last name. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, I won't test you. It's okay. Davey. No, Davey I, 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 it'll, it'll come to me. Give me a minute because I've been talking so much. I'll tell you what, we get commissioned. Dave, Dave, Dave Guthrie. Dave Guthrie. That, well, oh. he, he's very famous. In the, absolutely. So he, he's well, right. a Welshman, a Welshman, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, cannibal. But but it's because, and sometimes it's those moments when you <laughs> want to know, you do your two hours on stage. It's the yeah. people behind the scenes looking after you on the road, having yeah. a reliable driver and so on. So it makes life a lot easier, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. When you have a friend, you know. You see, a lot of guys when they become famous or semi-famous, they try to be dictatorial over people. I treat him like he's my brother, <laughs> like he's my father. We're pals, you know what I mean? Just don't get lost again, I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Go this way. I'm, I'm some, of them, some of the road you guys got there. It's pretty yeah. tough to find your way around. Especially in little villages, you know. A, oh, no, we, we, we love all that sort of stuff. But I always say, I know we, we have a lot of very famous people on this show. And the, and the bottom line is, we are all the same. You know, it's Shakespeare. Of course. Said, if you prick me, do I not bleed? If you tickle me, do I not laugh? We are the same underneath. And if you not, do not beg, you stink. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember that one in Shakespeare, but probably was somewhere. That's a new one for him. That was more. That was more Chaucer, I, I reckon. But it can be good. That's always thrill. Um, it's been an absolute. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm um, glad you decided to talk to me because. Oh no, fantastic! Well, just just a few last questions, but I always yeah. ask my yeah. guests. Is the, I like to open book. Uh, I love it. And, and you have got the book. It's an open book available on Amazon, as your son will tell us. Amazon, yes. yes. Very good. Uh, you've got your single out. Uh, Can't Stop Rocking is coming out uh, very, very shortly. So yes. do listen to that. I've listened. It is brilliant. It gets you going. I had a big smile on my face. I really like it. I really like it. I, you know, I, I, to have anybody still want to record me at my age is a miracle in itself. So the guy said, Charlie hasn't lost a thing except you're older. That's all. Well, how, how, did, how did it come? Um, tell me, how did it come about? So you suddenly say it's a great title, "Can't Stop Rocking." How how did it come about? You decided well, to Gary Lefkowitz. Uh, we met. He was playing for Chubby Checker, you know, and we met. And he said, "Charlie he said I like to do something." I said, well, "Listen, my life. I'm ready for anything at this point. What the like? What do I got to lose? You know what I mean? A couple of minutes or whatever time I got left." And we went under the store and we. And he's a terrific guy, and he's got a terrific musical mind. Because he wrote those talk, those terms, you know. And uh, whatever you want to do, man. Hey, listen, I got nothing to do during the day. You want to go in the studio? We'll go in the studio. Uh, that's all right with me. I'm happy. I've got the guitar in my hand. I'm happy. I can't get drunk. And uh, it's turned out well. Now, we didn't sell 10 million copies. We didn't sell 4 million copies. We didn't sell 50,000 copies. I don't know what they say. I'm happy that Charlie Grace is still alive and somebody's still playing my music. That's all I can tell you. Oh, fantastic. And over such a glorious career, what, what has been your biggest regret? I really don't have any, to tell you the truth. I did everything right. Didn't always turn out right. Not because of me, because of other circumstances. You know what I mean? Hey, listen, if, if we're playing cards and you're a cheat, I can't help that. You're taking cards from the bottom of the deck. I'm playing straight. So that's life. You play it straight. Some guys are out to beat you. It's like, what are you going to do? You want to get a gun and start shooting people? It's, I don't want to do that. That's the easy way out. So you take whatever happened. To, of course, you let them know your disfavor, you know. And, I don't, and if you see me cross the street, I don't want to see you, see you on the stage. But I've been through so many things in my life that nothing shocks me anymore. I mean, look at the way things are in the world today. How the world has changed. You know what I mean? That COVID put us all back. Good God Almighty. Terrible. Uh, well, let, let me put it another way then what what advice would you give the young Charlie starting out in the business well i'll just say this if you really love what you do give it everything you got that you may never make it but at least you'll have a chance to pick up a few extra bucks if you want to work weekend somewhere you know what i'm saying and uh, you uh, if you love it you love it man it's like i love fish and chips some guys don't like fish and chips you know what i mean so everybody's not going to like you but if enough people do, and you get, you got to be, 
what the Jewish people say, you need a little muscle, a little luck, man. Without that, I don't care how good you are, don't mean a thing. You got to have some luck, some a good angel on your shoulder, whatever. I don't know the answer. All I know is just keep going forward, 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 forward. And sooner or later, somebody will come along that sees your talent and give you a break. If it wasn't for the Paul Whiteman show and the guy didn't hear me on the radio, I never would have made my first record. So I th- I be- I'm a firm believer in destiny. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. And it's not a damn thing you can do changing it either. No, I, I, absolutely. That makes sense. And with your fish and chips, I have to ask you, do you, ha- do you like mushy peas? Now, to be honest with you, I'm not a big peas eater, mushy or any kind of peas, <laughs> except when well, Mike makes them with pasta. Do you ever have pasta and peas? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. It's like a, what they call a minest. It's like a wet, like a. So, so do you do you cook yourself then, Charlie? No, I haven't. I, I would starve to death. <laughs> no, I don't know how to cook. I, I know how to play and sing the guitar. I cut my own lawn. I still cut my own lawn. I love to put the mower. You know, gives me something to do. Yeah. And uh, I don't have any hobbies really. I don't. I'm a very dull person, honestly. <laughs> very dull. You don't seem dull at all. So what's your uh, glorious career then? What is your proudest moment? Well, <clears throat> it's difficult. Uh, one of the highlights of my career was doing the Ed Sullivan show, of course. That was the pinnacle of show business. I was on with people I should go see in the movies. Henry Fonda, uh, Don Amici, the great Will Chamberlain, the great basketball player from Philadelphia. Uh, what's the other guy? Ben Bloom, the silent fool. I mean, it was nice to go see these guys in the movies for 10 cents, right? That was a highlight. The second highlight was when I played the Paramount Theater with the Alan Freed shows and we got to meet Eddie and Eddie and, and all the other guys who worked together. That was, And of course, the London play. I mean, the uh, Hippodrome. Just to, be, to see my name that big in lights in a foreign country. You know? And of course, my record went to number one, which I never dreamt what happened. So the guy said, well, you only got one number one record. I said, it's one more than you got, pal. <laughs> that. But I had other, you know, light hits, top 10, top 40. So I, as a matter of fact, I had more hits in England than I had in America. Yeah. Oh, no, fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. And, and a glorious, glorious success. And I've been listening to lots of your catalogue, as well as the uh, Can't Stop Rocking, and absolutely brilliant. would recommend it to everybody. Do, do have a listen. Do listen to some of that back catalogue as well, because it's some fabulous, fabulous right. songs. I must have recorded 200 tunes in my life so far, at least. I, I didn't count them all, but somewhere around there. I'm sure Charlie Jr. will count them for you. Yeah, I will. <laughs> counting as we speak. Counting as we speak. I keep counting the money, make sure that comes in. Well, I'm at the point in my career now where I'm making handle everything. Just on what time do I have to get there? How long do I have to play? And how much money am I get? Well, well, good for you. Good for you. What does your daughter do? We, we've met Charlie. What, what does your daughter do? My daughter works for the high, local high school here. She's in charge of the printing department, and she's got a nice look. She worked for a supermarket for years, and she decided to make a change. And, you know, unfortunately, she's a diabetic, type 1 diabetic, and that's a tough way to live. But she's tough. She walks the line. The doctor said, you're doing everything good. Keep it up. And, I'm, and maybe that's why God's given us longevity so to take care of the worry of that. Listen, are you a parent? Yes, I am. I've got two wonderful children, best productions ever. I've got a wonderful daughter and a fantastic son as well. Well, there you go. You worry till they shut the lid on you, correct? They could be 90 years old and you're 110. You still worry about your kids. A good father and a good mother. Some fathers who take off, they haven't seen their kids in 50 years. I don't know how they could live like that, to be honest with you, but it's none of my business, okay? But you know what I mean? This is what you live for. What do you, what do you live for, man? Money? You can't take it with you. If you have $50 million, you can't take it with you. You know, look at the Kennedy family, the tragedy they had, how many kids they lost. Holy smoke, how you could keep the money. I don't want to, you know. So as long as you got a few quid to get some fish and chips and a little lager once in a while. <laughs> know what I mean? Well, when, when, you come, when you come over to London, Charlie, I'll tell you what, the fish and chips and the lager will be on me. Oh, that's true. I can't wait. <laughs> well, one final thing. Is Charlie Jr., is he involved yeah, in the music he's, business? He's, he's right here. He's right here. Yes, coming back. Oh, he's coming back here. Are you involved in the music business as well, Charlie Jr.? No, actually, I'm a school teacher. I work with uh, adjudicated youth, kids that are locked up, at-risk children. I've been doing it for almost 25 years, and I teach 20th century American history, and I incorporate the history of rock and roll 
Oh. In my curriculum, I, I've brought my dad in. I've brought oh, Bobby Rydell in. Oh, has he been a show and tell? Oh, I love it. I've brought I bring, my I bring own show and tell. The kids love it. They can't yeah. believe it. You know, and, uh, so that's what I do. Oh, and, I, and I try to help my dad as much as possible, of course. But, but you certainly have. You've been, it's been an absolute delight meeting Charlie Sr. and Charlie Jr. But finally okay. then, finally then to, to Charlie, Charlie Sr., how would you like to be remembered? Who, me? <laughs> well... I don't really, I don't, we just say he, he was a, a decent musician and a nice guy. That's all. That's, that's good enough. Andrew, let me say something. I, I think his calling in life is to make people happy through his music, all ages, all nationalities, cities, towns across the U.S. He's played all over Europe, of course, the U.K. I mean, wherever he goes, it's just, a, it's like, a, it's, it's, a, it's a festival type atmosphere and that, and that, it brings joy to people's lives. There's there's so much sadness and so many tears and so much yeah, sorrow. I think yeah. that's what you that's what you do best at. I guess so. People forget about their problems for a couple of hours when they come and see him, and that that's his legacy. And it's and, and the music's gonna be here long before you're gone and I'm gone, and it'll still be here. So yeah. Yeah. it will continue. Well, they there. said rock and roll wouldn't last more than two or three years. Yeah, I mean seventy years ago. Yeah, outlived all other forms of music. Yeah. It's still going strong. Yeah. Of course, today everything is electronic. When yeah. we started out, we tough. had to make our own music. Every note had to be picked. You know, we had amplifiers this big, six inches. Mm -hmm. Now they got them big as a wall. It sounds like thunder, you know, you press on the bumper. Oh, but you know what? That's progress. That's what you like. I like the old, for instance, like you ever hear the, uh, the, uh, the guitar riff on Rock Around the Clock? Oh, yeah. I, the guy from South Philadelphia, Danny Cedrone, his name was. He died. He was 33 years old. Fell down a step, broke his neck. That's a guitar player. Every note was specific. No gimmicks, no electronics, no reverb. That guy Straight. can play the guitar. And that's yeah. the one guy that I try to emulate, and I've never really approached that pinnacle that I would like to learn. Who else do you admire then? Well, I, I admire most people. Anybody that can make a buck singing and playing an instrument is tough. And then there's people that go to work every day that I admire. They hate their jobs. They do it for 20, 30 years, man. That, that's tough. That's tough. You know what I mean? At least when we when I go on stage, I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to be there and to get paid for it too. You know, I would have done it for nothing all these years. Well, right. don't say that, Charlie. I'll probably get 50 pounds less on the next gig. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you, it is Charlie Jr., Charlie Senior. It has been an absolute delight having you on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with us. Andrew, I never met you before, but I love you already, man. You. Can't stop rocking. Can't stop rocking. <laughs> They'll always be in England. Hey, we love it. Thank you. Take and rock and roll, too. <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> hurrah. <laughs> well, just before we go, I think there's something you wanted to say, Charlie. Yes. We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. But I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Berlin, 1944. <laughs> God bless. God bless you. Take care. Thank you so much, Charlie. I'll see you next time. Uh, so what a glorious, glorious time with the wonderful Charlie Gracie. Can't stop rocking. Uh, there's never been a truer word. Oh, what a fantastic career after all these so many years. Uh, still smiling and such an inspiration to Paul McCartney, George Harrison, all these wonderful names that he's worked with. Um, and he's a survivor. 63 years married, two glorious children. We met one of them um, and also spoke about the others as well. If you have any views on anything that we've discussed or would like to be a guest on the show yourself, you can write to me at guests at octopustv.com. That's guests at octopustv.com. Don't forget, you can follow me at Andrew Eborn, at Octopus TV, and subscribe on all of the usual platforms, more platforms than Paddington. Uh, but for me for now, thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next time. Be good, be safe, see you then.